recording. So we left executive session at 4.43 with no action taken. Um, actually, 4.42, but it's now 4.43. Next on our agenda is um, <clears throat> additional data reports um, for 2021. So um, in the past, at the board retreat, we've compiled a list of data that we hope to have brought to us annually. Um, hey, Andrew. Um, and so I think that that's the place that we're at again. I don't know if there are specific um, reports ready, but um, this is the place where we're looking for typically things like um, graduation rates, what students' plans are after they graduate. Um, and Jamie and I just thought we should revisit the data that we want to see collected. Um, so we haven't always been successful in collecting all the data that we want. I just know that people get really busy. Um, but it would be great if we could create a manageable list and then hold ourselves accountable to that. So, Jamie, do you have any more you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking if, if you guys provided us with the type of information you're looking for, like graduation date, post-secondary, secondary, I, I think it would make sense for us to be monitoring the percentage of our students engaging in Pathways, the percentage of our students engaging in Tech Center, just those types of things. I think it'll also be useful as we go to plan the budget. I know, Andrew, you mm -hmm. gave me feedback on ADM, um, an equalized pupil course that I added to the overall SU because I thought that was important for all the local districts. But this would be an addendum to the SU-wide data report. And did you just put something up, Andrew? We, I put up, I don't know if people can get in that link. It's the old metrics for success that we had We've done this a couple times. I can't remember what iteration yeah. that was. <laughs> Might have been a Todd Sears iteration. So yeah. if you can't open it, I can try to share it better. Try try doing the link again. It looks like it's just a link to the drive oh. folder instead well, of there. Open it in Google Docs and share it that way. Make that a pretty picture. Oh my God. <laughs> I just emailed it to the board. Yeah. <laughs> Superintendent 15. <laughs> so it should be in the board's email, but try with that one. Okay. Thank you. No, I got a request to access. Oh, I'm sorry. It's probably not mine. Right. I'm trying here. As long as it's not Todd's, we're probably okay. Look at Secret Ray and I are going to work behind the scenes and fix, fix this. I'm sending it to Ray. Ray will fix it. it oh, it's if a I weird document. I'd be happy to. <laughs> I can't. It's working now. It would be to make a copy. In. It worked. It worked. At least here. Okay. So the one metric that wasn't mentioned that I think is specific to our district is tuition students. Like, how are we doing on recruiting yeah, tuition students? Much. Yes. Mine's not loading yet, but. And it probably would be good to look at tuition students as a portion of the, like, total population of possible tuition students, you know, so that we have a high number or a low number, but the, the sending schools have higher low numbers. Of kids in those classes. Then. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, I feel like tuition students as well as voucher students because I know that we've had some students that actually come from communities with functioning high schools, but that have chosen White River Valley. Um, so. For that was school choice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's worth noting that as well. Um, 
Um, Ray, can you put that back up again? So do we want to move this into a Google Doc and update the title so it's not just Bethel? Um, and add the things that we've been talking about. And then I'm curious whether that's a manageable level um, or a manageable amount of data points. The PBIS is already on. When you guys did the climate survey, was that a homemade survey? Or did you guys use the SAS, Sandra? So when we did a climate survey, it was because we went through, um, yeah, Center for, what is it called, Owen? I'm having a brain cramp. Yeah, we, creative leadership. Yeah, and they did it for free. So that was the only thing I think about climate surveys to do it well is to use the same one over and over and not create your own. I always saw the SAS as kind of a climate survey. Could be. There was, um, we had two surveys we did. There was the Center for Creative Leadership through the Waddington and we might be able to get that through the Vermont Principals Association. Yep. And we also did a separate one before we merged because there were some complaints about um, the leadership. And that was Meg Powden, so that's way back. But that was this super comprehensive and super ridiculously expensive one. <clears throat> Well, I'm happy to reach out to the VPA. I, I do think having an annual one can really inform your guys' work at the building levels, but I think it's important to share publicly too. I agree. And I also, the thing we did with, we didn't survey parents, which I think is important. And we didn't survey students. It was really teachers only, but I think the three partners are essential. I agree. What I could do for the board is work on uh, trying to secure some examples hmm. from my colleagues, and then we could add it to an agenda um, at some point, maybe in December or something, and get feedback. And then we could launch, you know, we could do it. I, I like doing those surveys kind of after you get through February, because it can inform some of your work for June in the summer, in the August. Like when you think about professional development and things. Nice. But I'm happy to, you know, provide a few examples and then we could discuss them at a board meeting about which one we liked. Um, um, I've got a little bit of a delay, so I missed part of what you said. Um, I'm sorry, Jamie. No, it's all right. I was just saying I'm happy to reach out to my colleagues because I'm, you know, I'm sure several different SUs have used different climate surveys. Get some feedback from them because they've already vetted them. And then I could bring a couple for you guys to look through and make a decision which metric we want to use because I'd like to stick with it, like Andrew said, you know, mm -hmm. for a while so we can see if we're improving the things. Hey, Andrew. I just want to raise my hand. Um, my only feedback is, is that bringing all of this, I know at the bottom it says, bring this to the annual retreat, all this information, that is hard. And it feels much better to break it up throughout the year the way Jamie has. And I know it's not everything on this list, but much easier to do like, okay, I know I'm going to do this this month and it's not all at once. So I, if there's a way to do that, I'd prefer that. I, Andrew, um, I haven't looked at the form close enough to see that that's on there. I would agree with you that I'd like to break this up. It, at the bottom of the form, it says bring it to this retreat, which I did not FYI. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I'm wondering if that's something, once we agree on what the data is, if that's something we could request for the October meeting, that you make a manageable timeline for when we get this data. Um, because I feel like we could sit here and debate this as a whole group, but it would be quicker probably for you as an administrative team to break it down and bring it back. Okay. 
Owen's ready to dance. <laughs> yeah, I think too, like, I mean, on there, it says like for the, you know, if the students are going on to a two year or four year program or what they're doing out of after they graduate, you know, that that survey is in April, you know, I don't think we would want to wait until now to hear about that. So, so yeah, I think it makes sense to, you know, after, you know, after graduation or at the May meeting or the June meeting or whatever that, you know, that's when that data would be presented. So yeah, I think as things come forward, it makes sense to present them while they're still sort of fresh rather than sitting on until months later. I'm also wondering, am I muted? No, okay. I'm also wondering about um, SBAC data, SAT, ACT, those um, sorts of measures. SBAC's on the overall SU one. Okay. The yeah. SAT, ACT's not. I just think it would be useful in terms yeah. of um, knowing where students go or what they're doing and, and their levels are. And since we do, back when this was made for Bethel, Bethel wasn't offering any AP courses. And I know that we do offer AP courses at this point in time, maybe not as robust this year as like they have been, um, just because this is such an atypical year. But I wonder, um, out of the number of students who take part in those AP courses and take the tests, how many of them get scores high enough that potentially they're getting college credit um, for those classes? Nope. Okay, great point. Lisa, also, if I may? Yep. I think, it, um, I think it's nice to have the data about the class that's graduating. Mm -hmm. but I think the thing that we want to do is be looking at patterns and trends. And otherwise, we're looking at anecdotes of, of like 40 to 50 kids per year, right? And it's great to know that 70% of our kids were accepted to two-year or four-year colleges. And it's good to set those goals. But I think there's also, we get to start seeing patterns and looking at, oh, kids, we had this many kids involved in co-curriculars, and our numbers were here, and we can start seeing correlation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's where, like, I think if we get this stuff kind of reported out throughout the year, but then we put it all in one place so that when we're at a retreat, we can look at it all at once. That well, the nice thing is, is, I think the way we've been doing it is it'll be, it'll be at least in those board folders. So I could easily pull that all together Yeah. just before the retreat. Because every, all these reports now are being saved within your guys' board folder. Mm-hmm. So I know, um, I wonder if separate from this data, we want sort of a senior um, report, maybe in in August, would that give people enough time to look at the SAT scores, the AP and the ACT scores? Um, and what I'd be interested in seeing, similar to what Owen said, is that that group's growth over time, which I think we've been doing STAR 360 long enough now that potentially we could look at that um, for students that have been ours from seven through 12, or sorry, nine through 12, um, or potentially even six through 12, uh, if we wanna look at the whole system. Because what I'd love to see is how we're moving students forward. Um, yeah, that's and, more growth, right. right. So, so everybody in the room knows, since that's not something we usually talk about at the board level, a uh, decision was made uh, 15 months ago or so uh, to not test 11th and 12th graders with the STAR 360. So that's not data we've been collecting. Okay. Uh, um, we well, could, I think it costs about three or $400 a grade level. Uh, no, Andra? Can't hear you. I just don't think there's value in it also. I agree that there's enough other testing we do at that age level and enough other data, but that's me. So that's why I was shaking my head. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll, I guess I, I'll speak as someone who was a high school principal. We also stopped at those grades for the same reason. 
Um, and we started using some of this other data you were talking about in regards to AP, ACT, things of that nature. We felt like SBAC um, was a better measure at the high school level for growth. Yeah, I mean, I think that start, I, I think testing for the sake of testing isn't necessary. Um, and kids just get super bitter about it. And why wouldn't they? Um, so I think the SAT and the AP tests, um, as students sit for them in the ACT, are probably better measures. Um, I'm wondering if at our high school what the what the expectations are for students sitting for those tests. Like I know that some high schools require the PSAT at certain grade levels um, or require the ACT of all their seniors or juniors. Um, so I guess I don't know enough right now to know what what's reasonable for us to expect. And I'd like to know. We, we do not require that. Uh, but that's something we could put in our budget for next year if the board felt strongly about providing that to all students. That's I mean, one way to do get more testing of students is to pay for their exams and, uh, you know, you'll get more scores and whatnot out of it. But it, it also brings your average for the school down when you test everybody with, you know, folks who uh, have no intention of, of going to college. and don't care about sitting for a three hour test. We, we see that yeah. with the star 360, which only takes 25 minutes. They're, you know, ninth graders who go in and they're like, I don't care. And, you know, it's hard to hold them accountable for, for trying, so. But don't we, isn't there a way for us to create an aspirational goal of, of having students um, want to, to be, um, do well on an assessment that also provides them a, a entry point to post-secondary engagement. It, it's so, very, I'll, I'll share my personal experience. My daughter just finished applying to colleges and of the nine colleges she applied to, I think only set, only two required a test. And so when we tried to push her to take the test again as a senior, she's like, the, the colleges make it optional. And this was for the most selective elite colleges that she was applying to. So kids, you know, applying to state schools, there, there really is no expectation of testing in most schools anymore. I agree. Or that's for why ACT and SAT that. or for PSAT? Any tests. Uh, uh, no we still ask for ACT or SAT for high school grads. Yeah, I, it's right. I was going to say, I think the only one in state that doesn't require any form of test is CCV. Um, well, you know, so the other thing I think we should look to do, I mean, I, I wonder <laughs> if we should be saying to students, if you demonstrate proficiency in these areas, that's right, then you're awarded proficiency. And I know we still call it credit, but that, that I had a lot of success saying to students, if you demonstrate proficiency on SBAC, then you're, that equates to these proficiencies for high school graduation, because you demonstrated it within a proficiency-based system. And so I think there's some areas that we can look to leverage it that way too, so that students understand this is another way I can demonstrate proficiency. This is another way potentially I could show, no, I have mastered this content. This is where I think the the concept of aspiration and personalized learning. So then students are preparing themselves for an, a, something after secondary education. So it doesn't need to be an SAT or a PSAT, but to document their learning and to measure it against other like students nationally or internationally, or even just to create their own write their own resume or their own like portfolio of learning. I think that is probably more valuable and more, more engaging to students. Um, the SBAC only goes as high as ninth grade, correct? Science is up to 10th, right? Science is 11th. 11th, right, but well, SBAC- It's only 11th, it's not a ninth or 10th. Right. So it's eighth and 11th. Right. So I mean my, my data pool is pretty limited, but um, 
I just struggle with the idea that a student might change their decision at the last minute. And if we don't ask them to sit for a test like the ACT or, or SAT, that then we end up with a situation. And this literally happened two years ago to a student of mine. Um, she decided she wanted to go into the nursing program at VTC and she hadn't taken any of those tests and therefore they wouldn't even look at her application. Um, and the score actually mattered less than having actually sat for the test. Um, so that I guess that's what I'm thinking about when Owen talks about you know being aspirational. I just struggle with the idea that we would function in a way that would close doors for students potentially because their frontal cortex isn't fully formed yet. And I think sometimes you know, using the levers we have to help them leave doors open makes a lot of sense to me. Well, for what it's worth, two thirds of the students with us in the building are sitting for the seniors are sitting for the SAT next Wednesday. Nice. So, that's good. How, how many students do we have? Many students that take the PSAT each year, or how many do that? Is it, I mean, I guess it sounds like it's optional for them. Do they have to like pursue it on their own to do that or how does that uh, work? That's something we offer in the school for students. Uh, I don't know how many students took it last year. In the past, Chris, we have uh, the whole sophomore class took it. Yeah. I, hate to have, I hate the ranking by grade too, because we're moving away from that. Like Jamie's point about proficiency. If you, why couldn't we be taking PSATs in eighth grade? or or whatever, right? Well, as a part of PSAT, isn't that how they identify like National Merit Scholars? Uh, yeah, so that's part exactly. Of the that's the path, but it's also, we also know that there's a bias on the test, and yeah. we also know that it's an industry. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it could be lot, done. There's a lot to put on the scales, I think. Yeah, I'm sure they could do it, because I mean, I took the SAT when I was in the seventh grade. Um, yeah. So. Oh, now you're telling us you're a smarty pants. I know. That's what I was just thinking. You're well, an egghead. Some... I love meeting eggheads. <laughs> I need to surround myself with smart people. Yeah, it was some program where that it was, I forget what, some seventh grade test. If you did well on that, then you got invited to. The Johns Hopkins? Uh, it was Duke that was running oh. the program. Yeah. So. Good for you. I'm in favor of giving the PSATs, the PSATs, um, sophomore year I've all it's always been done in my in my schools yeah well so for the purposes of this discussion it seems like we're kind of getting into stuff that the administrators should basically be dealing with in my mind like what specific tests people take I can see Lisa's point where we want to make sure like maybe we do have a policy where we make sure they take a test so that if they want to go to school they can or they can't but other than that I think we should let the administrators decide, you know, what tests are appropriate for. You know, I think we should ask for a report that monitors cohort growth using whatever test, you know, seems appropriate for doing that, and then let them decide the details, since that's what we're paying for. But isn't there also a thing of we should be able to see where kids are on our proficiency scales? And isn't that an indicator of growth? Yeah, I agree that that is an indicator of growth. Do you feel like we're at a place with our proficiency-based grading um, that th that that level of data is being collected? Whoop, whoop. At the middle school, we're just starting it this year. We're going to have all proficiency grading. Prepare yeah. for a backlash from parents. And a board member. It's happened in every town, and you know this. Um. I mean, like, I, I think that that's great, but we also should be making sure we're comparing ourselves on a, you know, more than just our school level, too. So that we're seeing Absolutely. If our proficiencies line up with everything else. So I think that can be both. Absolutely. And there, every school has also been uh, cre needed to create a conversion for people that still have Carnegie mindsets. Mm-hmm. So I do appreciate that. I wonder if that's a, a separate report. I don't know. It I is. like the idea of 
of a, a senior report that could come to us and look at that group's growth over time. Um, I feel like that could include um, qualitative data on meeting proficiencies. Yeah, and also maybe even interviews. I mean, and I like, I, I think Andrew's right. This is our work. Yeah. But I think we need to request, like I like the idea of a senior report, but it, it could also just be kind of a state of the school where you get the what the senior class did, but then kind of a look at the other grades too to see, you know, how many of our kids are meeting proficiencies and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We are, uh, our students, um, the proficiency graded right now in high school, and do they still receive a letter grade? Or a number grade? Uh, I don't know when, but South Royalton stopped using letter grades a long time ago. Okay. Uh, they use a number grade. It's a number grade. Uh, we continue to use number grades. Okay. Uh, the proficiencies or learning expectations are embedded within that curriculum. Uh, and depending on the class, the level to which the proficiency learning scales are used varies. So. You, you'll find some classes where every assignment's graded on a proficiency-based learning scale, and some classes where they're still working towards having a learning scale for every major asset, summative assessment. Uh, I, I, I don't want our kids um, to be um, hurt by the fact that we're not giving them a number grade or a letter grade when it comes to college. And um, Chris, you're right in the right in the college setting. I mean, uh, they ex they look for number grades or letter grades, or what are they looking for now? Uh, I mean, our admissions department when they look at stuff, yeah, you're looking at like you know when it comes to different things, they're looking at GPAs and class rank. Uh, uh, and then SAT, ACT, and those types yeah. of things. Uh, yeah, you still uh, have to have a, you still have to have a GPA, and I, and you have to have class rank, and definitely those other tests. But the school profile is critical as well, to make certain it explains the rigor of the program, thing that you provide, the different experiences students have, and really articulates an overall you know, course of studies yeah. that's top notch. I mean, I found that the, uh, some schools miss the boat, I think, um, with their school profile and really do a disservice to their students if it doesn't communicate all the offerings the students have and the expectations. Yeah. I just don't want us to give up a letter grade or a number grade uh, until the colleges change their admission standards. I think a lot of colleges, as we've moved to, as different states have moved to proficiency-based grading, actually calculate their own um, scores for students. Because a couple years ago, I was at a meeting um, and learned that like Middlebury takes the student's transcript and they recalculate the GPA, removing like band and PE and things that are considered less academically rigorous. Okay. Um, so, so different schools have different metrics. Um, I don't want to go to a proficiency-based report card completely without a, without a letter grade, without a number grade, until colleges are accepting that kind of information. So. Yeah. All right. Owen? Yeah, uh, I'm going to post in their um, chat. There's 85 New England colleges now accept proficiency grading as a way to enter college. And they do do a conversion. I also just said do do. So I think, you know, we are we are actually in a time period, I think, when we're in transition. And I don't think we should ever throw out or put any barriers in front of our kids success. But I think we need to be open to both ways of getting there. And my understanding, having worked in guidance for years, for 10 years, was that it's really important how the student presents themselves, including their GPA, but who they are personally and what they bring to that school and what value they will bring to the school 
And I also think that it's important that we teach kids to shop for schools because they're yeah, paying. I think, I guess as the superintendent, what I've talked to with Reed, I'm less concerned about what the report card looks like. I'm more concerned about how the teaching instruction leads itself to proficiency-based learning. Mm -hmm. And right now, the area that I'm concerned that we don't have is different modes toward graduation and that credits right now are still the way for students to graduate. And that's my concern. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, how we report it, it needs to be clear. I think it needs to communicate proficiency, right? Yeah. And it's easy to understand. My worry is, is that we're still counting credits. And yeah. that's, that's something I think as we're in transition that we need to move toward not saying you have to do school these ways. Like I said, in a proficiency-based system of students highly proficient on the SAT, there should be a way for us to demonstrate proficiency in that. I don't know if we award credits right now, Reed, or what we do, but that should be a mode that we can say, no, you did achieve something. Mm -hmm. And that's the area I'd like us to continue to focus our work on. Credit's a state thing. Well, mm -hmm. credits have gone away. I mean, we shouldn't be counting credits within, yeah, within that, right? that law. Yeah, that's the problem right now. Yeah, we are behind in that regard. That was last year, right? <clears throat> 2020. Um, one of the things that's not counted on this report, but that we also thought about um, on the Wickham side of things, which we said we would revisit once we had a few years under our belt, and I feel like we do, is whether or not um, we should have any sort of capstone project. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if now is the time to start thinking. I mean, I feel like this school year is maybe <laughs> a hard year to think about it. But at the same time, one of the things that I'm reading in literature about um, distance learning and remote learning is that students need, you know, the, the motivation of uh, um, project-based experience, yeah. which a capstone can um, expose kids to members of their community, career readiness, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm just wondering what the thinking is about that among board members and members of our administrative team. I'm in favor of that, Lisa. I have a strong opinion about that. And we, I'm proud of the work at Whitcomb before we merged where we created a gateway program and we studied several programs around the state and nationally and that it wasn't just your senior year, it was every year. And like us, also like adults, we have to produce projects. We work on things and then we present them and then we get feedback. And it's not just good practice, it's also about teaching kids that they can work from their passion, but also how to organize their thinking and learning and how to present that. It can be group presented, it can be hands-on, it could be all cognitive and intellectual, I think it does work with the flexible pathways model too, but no dioramas, unless they're in a museum. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a diorama that's a capstone project for a senior. Yeah. I mean, I'll just add, I think we have to trickle that up. Mm -hmm. I think we have to start that young and start working on those skill sets and then you move it up. Um, I found that the quality of the work was uh, much higher if you start with students in like grade five. Yeah. Um, and you teach students how to, you know, have a passion and have personalized learning. And it's a really authentic way to start to introduce that work. And you trickle it up as you go and you increase the rigor as you go, like Owen was saying. I don't think it can be one stop shopping because I think if we if we don't explicitly teach those skills, sometimes we set our seniors up and we say, oh, we I have really worked on those skills the whole time. And it's also oh. we really truly work on those transferable skills. Mm -hmm. And I, I also find it increases the rigor in written expression a great deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are we thinking like capstones at the end of fifth and eighth grade and then finally phasing back in a senior project? 
I think it should be every grade starting in middle school. Okay. I think it should be six through 12. I don't, I'm all for like pre-K through five too. But I, I, I know that I could help trickle that up through the middle school. I we also, need to add another thing on Andrew's list, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that we could start it like that and it could be, and I think we could really base it in the personalized learning model. But the way we did it in Whitcomb was those early grades, like seventh grade is where we started it. They, it was really, it was really hand-holding. And, you know, it was also like really focused on writing and the transferable skills. And as they got older, it got more personal. And mm -hmm. the expectations were much higher. And the, the critique was much more intense. Awesome. I, um, I just noticed that Lisa McCrory unmuted, and I'm wondering if that's because she wanted to jump into this conversation. Uh, I had something um, a few a few people ago, and I think I've forgotten what I was going to ask. Oh. That's all right. I'll um, it'll come back to me, I suppose. If you it does. Turn that camera on and wait, Lisa. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, as soon as I will try to be more watchful. Okay, um, so I've done some editing and I think maybe Andra has two in this document and I just wanna put it in our chat so everybody can take a look um, and see if we're satisfied with the metrics that we um, have there or if there's anything we feel like we need to add. Oh, I was taking notes and was gonna do it for you. Look at you guys. Okay. Um, so if anybody wants to, I'm wondering if we want to mute our cameras, take like a five minute break if anyone needs to refill their water or run to the bathroom. Um, and then we'll um, have a discussion, warm pool feedback about this list. Okay. Everybody's frozen on my screen. So I'm going to take that as affirmation. So five minutes. We're just waiting for a couple more people to join us. Andrew, whose picture do you have on your sweater? That looks like you. It's me. It's me. We can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> We all are wearing our smiling faces so that kids can see our smiles even when oh, we're wearing Oh, that's an amazing idea. I can't take any credit. It was a hospital that did it first. And, um, but we bought a button machine and made everyone's face. So they have the capacity to wear their face on their shirt. <laughs> so board members, also, board members could have their own buttons too. If you want your face on a button, I'm your girl. <laughs> I also read, um, went through an activity that um, people have been doing at some schools where they have um, teachers first model it and then um, have students follow through on like the reasons why they wear their masks. So they make a poster mm -hmm. like the reason why I wear my mask. Mm -hmm. um, I like so that. people in your lives that you care about just so that if kids like if it gets hard, as it inevitably does, to wear a mask all day, you know, you've got that reminder. I wear my mask for you. Right. I do. You could have, yep. Plus I like the fashion. I know, my husband works with a woman who's making masks and every time she makes one or that he thinks I'll like, um, I just have so many now. I, I'm getting people masks for their birthday. Feels like the right thing to do. I know. Um, so our break has gone a little long. We're waiting for a couple of people to come back. I'm hoping that maybe they can hear my voice. So in the interest of time, I'd like to move forward. Um, I uh, hope everybody had an opportunity to look at this document. Um, and I'd like to do sort of a rapid fire tuning protocol so maybe we'll look at it ask any questions that we have about the document make sure that it's giving us the information that we feel like we want to have um, then offer warm and cool feedback about this document modify as needed um, and then move on to the next part of our agenda does that make sense 
as a way to proceed. Yes. Is it possible to have commentary put on the document so that it could be documented what people are saying? Um, would someone like to take notes? It just slows down my facilitation if I'm taking notes and trying to facilitate at the same time. I've been taking notes so far. I do my best to keep track of who says what. Okay. Um, I think that what Owen was asking, it was for comments in the White River Union District metrics for success document. Okay. Um, um, if you And did you, did you unmute specifically for that, Lisa? Because I saw that you unmuted earlier. I have. Yeah, well, you know, my thoughts go through me. I'm trying to take notes and keep track of this. So if I have a comment and I lose it, then it's lost because I'm okay. taking But um, so I, I do want to, I'll add, as far as looking at the metrics for success, uh, the edited version, um, Owen, you're wanting to make sure that if somebody has feedback that we're connecting that feedback to a name. Is that correct? Well, there's actually a uh, commentary uh, possibility on the document is what I was thinking. So you wouldn't have to do it. The person could make their own comment. Oh, okay. Perfect. Andrew, can you walk people through how to do that, please? Because I forget. So you highlight it. Yep. After so you show us. Yeah. So I already did it. So for example, I highlighted the words metrics for success and then a box pops up and then you just write him say your notes in it. And if you want, you do the at sign or the plus sign in front of somebody's name and you assign that to them. Anyways, I'm happy to mostly do this. It's fine. Let's just rock it out. And if people All want right. it, we can, they can help. All right, I'm just sending, um, Jamie, a quick message for the conference room in case they want to join us again. All right, so um, any questions of clarification um, or other questions about this document that people may have? What's the time on this? No the how much time do we want to spend on this? Um, I don't, I, I, I'm terrible at that. How much time do you think it's appropriate to spend on questions um, related to this. Doing warm, cool feedback and comments. Yep. So we'll start with questions first, then feedback. Let's say 15 minutes. Does anyone want to be the timekeeper? So if we're going to pay attention to time, Andrew will do that as well. Okay. Get a multitask. Um, I already put my thoughts on there. Do you get a report? Okay. So this is. Um, can I make a report? Okay, I don't get that. So it would be awesome if you could share that with me. So Lisa, um, did you want to share? And the conference room is a little noisy for us. And then getting the phone calls that I got last week. I know we don't have a question for this person. So we could share that with you. Gosh. <laughs> Okay. So for me, um, this, um, I would love to see something uh, and where they end up those population numbers, whether they're uh, participating at a small degree or a larger or actually become full time students over time. Does that make sense? We you broke up on that. Um, I, I guess I'd love to see um, some measurement or monitoring of homeschool families and students. Yeah, I like um, it. Because there's some that become full-time students. There's some that continue to just take one or two classes and we can't really keep them as um, students, but their involvement, you know, whether it's just through sports or whether through drama or a couple electives. I'd, I'd love to see how that um, nice happens over time. I, I also think it would be good to maybe even survey them annually. Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. also if we could, I think we have the data, but data such as like students that, um, I don't know, that attend, I don't know, never mind. I haven't thought it through. Okay. 
Um, any other questions of either clarification or deeper questions about um, this situation? Or not situation, I'm sorry, um, about this document. So um, we're gonna add a, go ahead, Anna. So we're going to add a column, another column that has dates uh, that we can expect them to come to board meetings, different things that makes better sense. And then are we agreeing, though, that there'll be a compilation at some point? Or yeah, I thought we already talked about this. I thought that you guys were going to give this to the admin group to put dates on and then bring it back to you. And then the compilation, Andrew, I, I can pull this data just from the monthly reports and put it into one fo folder. So that will be the superintendent is in charge of that. I got it. Good. That's what <laughs> you were looking for. Who's in charge of it? A complete report will be prepared by the superintendent. All right. So my one question would be, um, you know, we had our uh, racial equity statement. Um, do we want to have any racial equity metrics or like, I guess with all of these, we could be breaking them down by race in addition to what we do, or like our population numbers too low to make it sense to do that, or, you know, just how do we want to address that part of this? I'm thinking that, that those two groups that are working with the two facilitators, Andrew, as part of that policy that they're working on, I'm assuming that they're going to have some way for us to measure it. Every other policy I've seen that, that they produced provided procedures and what we had to report out on annually. I just don't feel like I have enough expertise to add anything to necessarily know how we should measure that, although I think we need to. Okay. Just when that comes out, we should add it to this. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about that, Lisa, the work you've done, um, for, you know, in your professional life around this work or Owen, but I feel like that group should weigh in. Yeah, I feel like that makes a lot of sense. Um, great. Any other questions about this um, or thoughts on anything that we should add or that you wish you had? Um, so I, we I, as long as the notes reflect the piece about equity, um, I'm happy to defer that until we hear from that group. Um, I don't want to lose that thread that a Andrew brought up, though. The, the equity group is really just working from an interview process right now. Mm -hmm. So is it also a place where we would put our attendance data, including like truancy um, letters, like how many people we've moved to maybe the state attorney? I don't know. It seems like I think that could all be part of your guys is comprehensive social emotional okay. support as you get better at those. Good, because the title is uh, metrics for success. And I, I think that it's important to measure those things to move towards success, of course. All right. Good. Yeah. Um, one of the things that when I read this carefully, when we took our break um, that I thought about um, one of the things when we originally drafted this document that we were curious about, and I remain curious about this because I think one of the um, one of the things that is most important about school for kids is connections with adults that care about them, and so the teacher attendance piece um, by like percentage rate, I don't want to necessarily know anyone's personnel file. But I think that it can be indicative of it being a hard place to work if you have a lot of people absent all the time. And it also reduces the quality of education that students are receiving when their teachers are absent and they're being taught by a sub regularly. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask what the group thinks about leaving that in, or is that an unreasonable request, I guess I would ask of the administration. I'd be comfortable doing it. I might do it in executive session under personnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess like how, if you have two teachers that have pregnancies, uh, would that show up under absences or is that something different? Cause that doesn't reflect on climate at all. You know, I, I think that that's kind of the sort of thing that if you have a serious illness or something like, 
Uh, can you measure unexcused absences or something? I think right, it also has the impact on the education in the classroom with the teacher missing. I, I wonder if we have an overall percentage, but then as a narrative portion of the report, um, Jamie or the building administrators, whoever presents it could say, but yes, we had three teachers have babies this year and one person battling cancer. Um, and that accounted for X percent. Um, nice. So I wonder if we have the raw data and then narrative um, information. I would like each principal to report on their school culture because I think that that's that's key to how the faculty react and and what they do. Um, I don't know in this in the schools that I've had, I've never felt that I was that those that those days that are given in the contract for whatever were. Uh, I've never felt that a teacher was abusing them. And if I did, mm -hmm. I'd go to the teacher and talk to him about it. So right. So where it says climate survey, would you feel better if we added culture and climate survey? And if there were some pieces about the building culture, I think that's often looped together. But we could be more explicit with that. Well, that's something the association does every year, Jimmy. Didn't they send some kind of survey, or was that just last year that they did it? I think that was last year. Some. Um, some schools have a, a a culture committee that I know South Relton used to. Um, I've never had one in my school, but I've always thought that was a good idea. But I think a principal should constantly be looking at the culture of his school, and I feel like the principals could report on that. I I think they they can explain what their culture is. I think that's good. Andrea. And the other question. Uh, just a comment. There is a climate um, group that works between both schools. They're actually working together, but it wouldn't say, I mean, they do like fantastically fun things and celebrate birthdays and it's, it's nice. And they're building, using traditions from both schools now um, going forward this year. They met this summer for the first time. So I know there was a Friday get together that was planned last week and, and they have other things they're trying to do given given the global pandemic too. <laughs> that makes it more challenging, no doubt. A little bit more, but I appreciate that they, it really took it upon themselves to try to bring the group together, really, the teachers did. And the other thing, you know, um, I don't know, I, if I had teachers taking personal days at the same time, and it was, it was causing a problem in, in my school as far as coverage, or I would talk to them. And I always found that a teacher would try to change their schedule to help out. And I, I think communication between the between the principal and his staff are really important. And if it's done right, you get all sorts of cooperation. Amy, Amy, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Okay, so other thoughts on this. We have um, extracurriculars, curriculum, climate survey, PBIS. Lisa, under extracurricular, I would be very interested in us uh, having quantitative data to that too, about the percentage mm -hmm. of students that are participating. And I also would like to break that down by gender. Um, yes. I just think that that's a metric. I just think if you look at Real, genuine, uh, you heard me say this before when I worked at Randolph, but I think those are some of the ways that you can create really authentic relationships between students and staff. And I also was thinking in that we should be measuring what percentage of our staff are engaged in extracurricular offerings in regards to offering clubs, offer, you know, do, coaching sports, doing the drama. I'd be really interested in seeing that percentage of our staff doing that because I do think you create some really long lasting authentic relationships when your staff and students are doing those common interests together. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the knitting club we started at, at Randolph and some of those types of groups where students and the teacher 
had great conversations, but they were doing something that they both enjoyed. Yeah. And those relationships can, I mean, they're so important. Yeah. All right. Um, any other observations or our warmer, cool feedback or things you feel need to be added that we as a board would like to like to have information on? I think we've got a pretty comprehensive list so far. Yeah, it will keep me busy for quite a while, it looks like. Okay. Warm feedback is that I found this list. Yes. <laughs> we have to recreate it. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. I guess okay. The only other feedback was to, would be to make sure that we follow through on it because, like, we made this last year and then we didn't see much. From okay. it. I have a phone call from the superintendent. Oh, I yeah, try me too. I wonder if we should have it make sure it's a standing um, thing on the board agenda. No, Andrew. I wonder. I'm going to add it to the calendar, and you'll get an email from me monthly saying, "Don't forget, you have to include this in your report." Don't you worry, I won't forget. <laughs> All right. So I appreciate that accountability measure being built in. Okay. Um, any other comments about this before we move on to um, our literacy work report? We'll just begin to jump into that before we get to the financial piece. Just a reminder, you got 14 minutes until you're six o'clock. Right, that's what that's what I meant by the financial piece. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, we'll move it on to the literacy update. Um, I asked for this work or this report um, based on the fact that we've been working on literacy in our schools for a couple of years. I know that we probably don't have um, data yet for this year, getting back in to see what sort of gaps we're facing as a result of remote learning last spring. Um, but I just was wondering if we could have an update about how that work is going in our schools. Yeah, I think it makes sense for us to start with Andra. Um, since a great deal of the work and the focus this so far has been on the primary grades. And then I can I can add some things as we're what the next phase to the literacy work too. Mm -hmm. You good, Andrew? So you just want me to say where we're at, really? <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like you to give them an overall update of what are you currently doing? What have you improved over the summer? What have you guys focused on? I know we did a bunch of professional development. Just kind of give them a sense of, you know, how we built. So I think that if we didn't have a global pandemic, we might be a little bit further ahead, just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> we have been really focusing on the Fountas and Pinnell just format of all of our curriculum work. And so there's different pieces to, to what literacy, little different pieces. And this year right now we're working on the phonics piece and rolling that out. And so what we've done is taken each little piece of the Fountas and Pinnell framework and broken it down and gone really slow so that every piece we roll out, we do really well. I feel really confident that we are doing their assessments um, with fidelity and that we're getting a lot of knowledge about really like why kids are doing what they're doing with the reading, why they're not and what we need to work on. So that feels great. Um, I know that we haven't, haven't been able to sit with kids and listen to them read, um, you know, since March. So I know those assessments are happening right now and people are feeling, it's, it's just good to see that there actually was some growth over the, the time that kids weren't in school and just to see that some, gain, some gains have been made. So we're working on, a lot of what we're working on too is just um, re-looking at how we're doing what we're doing, like word walls, making sure everybody has a word wall and just leveling the practice across all classrooms. Um, at the same time, which is not what we had planned to do, is how does this translate into doing this online and preparing for if and when we do go back online, how to do this and do this well? Because that was a bit of a scramble and we're used to teaching kids with real books and not necessarily with screens. And um, 
And, you know, I know, I know this was talked about a lot earlier, but like engaging a kid on a screen is just not easy. And it's a skill set that not, nobody went to school for here. I it would even say for me, managing a, a staff meeting on a screen is a, a skill set I have been developing myself. So, um, so with literacy, we're just really working on, on those aspects. I would say um, there's a lot, lot to learn still, um, but I think we've really focused on the Fountas and Pinnell. I do know there's some other um, reading instruction that's happening with our special educators. And I can't remember exactly what it's called, Jamie. DI is what it's, the initials are. Do you remember with what? Some specific students, not all students, but it with is. Our, with our, just some of our identified students. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm sorry, I wasn't like really super prepared to talk a lot about it, but I do feel like we're rolling it out. And I think not only are we rolling out this, we're figuring out how to roll it out in a virtual way when and if we have to go back. So I can jump in and then the other two principals can jump in. In addition to that, some things that I've seen within our literacy work is um, we are rolling out the phonics and fountains and Pinal. I'm concerned still about our teachers' depth of knowledge in literacy. And what I mean by that is to truly teach students who have um, real hangups with decoding and encoding. And so one of the things I've been talking about with Mary Ellen and Amy Toth is that I think we do need to further um, leverage the Stern Center to provide additional professional development in phonics. Um, I think that the Fountas Pinnell phonics is great. I think again though, Fountas and Pinnell is an approach, but they have really great materials. I think we need to have greater depth of expertise um, to really make certain that we can reach all students universally. And so we are going to be looking as we're budgeting moving forward on leveraging some of our title funds for that type of professional development next school year uh, through the Stern Center for Language and Learning. Um, one of the things, too, that Don and I have noticed in regards to when we were talking about interventions and supports, the menu's not at as deep as we need it to be. We have level literacy intervention right now, but beyond that, uh, we don't have uh, our, our, all of our special educators trained up in an approach like Wilson or Orton Gillingham. And so DI is one of the things that we did do uh, prior to my tenure. So we are using that for some of our struggling readers and progress monitoring that data. But we definitely need to increase um, the depth in regards to our menu of interventions for literacy. Um, I think that one of the things I talked to Amy about too is, yes, we have to address reading. Yes, we have to make certain our third graders can start to learn that they can read to learn. I think third grade is that transition year where you're reading to learn. And that's a way for us to measure whether or not we're having success. Um, then I think we have to increase uh, our explicit instruction in writing because um, my sense is we're probably a little bit all over the board in regards to how we're approaching writing. And I think we need a systematic way to approach writing just like we are reading. So when we think about literacy in general, I would see that as being the next step after we will focus on the phonics work this year and into next, but we also need to make sure we're keeping our eye on how we approach in writing instruction. Can you, uh, can you talk about the, uh, is, there, is there a reading teacher or, I mean, understand each one of the teachers are being trained. Yeah. But so, is there a reading teacher? Is there a. Yeah. You want to talk about your reading interventionist, Andrea? We have reading interventionists. Yeah. So we have reading interventionists in each school. And I would say, you know, I agree with Jamie that they have a diff lots of different levels of, of knowledge. And so I wouldn't say that every kid has access to the same. Um, same interventions because some people on one campus are trained in Orton Gillingham, some on the other campus are trained in Wilson. It'd be great to have all those same resources on every campus. Are they interventionists? Are they certified reading teachers? Or Absolutely, they are. Otherwise, the, the federal the government. Intervention is for um, okay, so, and they're trained in Orton Gillingham. So that's Wilson, where. Well, that's it's a mixed bag so they do all have reading certification but 
I, I know on one campus, one has Orrin Gillingham and on another campus, a few have Wilson, but it's not, it's, they don't all have the same skill sets. Okay. And that's, you know, I think that one of the, you know, differences of opinion is, Bob, Orton Gillingham is an approach to teaching. There's a great deal of depth and certification right. that right. goes into that. Right. Wilson, you go through training, but it is a program. Yeah. It's a scope and sequence that you follow with a program. My worry about programs is, is that you can implement it, but I worry about do you have the expertise to be prescriptive and adjust if a student's still struggling. Mm -hmm. And that's the level and depth of expertise that I'm still concerned we don't have. Um, and so that's why I'm looking at how do we increase professional development through the Stern Center, because I found that their training really provides teachers with a depth of knowledge and understanding so that when a student's hung up, they understand exactly where they're hung up. And I think it's really important for all of our elementary teachers to be teaching and understand the scope and sequence around the different syllable types. Um, and I have a sense right now that some of our teachers um, wouldn't be proficient in that. And that's not, that's just teacher training programs and that we don't go to that level of depth. Um, that's nothing that's not critical about our teachers. They just, they haven't been taught it. I do think one of our benefits, though, is having Mindy Beth Pike in that um, MTSSA position. She is a certified reading teacher. She does have a really great depth of knowledge, and she's a wonderful coach who's going in to classrooms, and it doesn't feel threatening. It's, it's different than maybe me coming in and giving some cool feedback. Um, so that's I think that's a plus. And I think she is really working hard to level the playing field of knowledge with what we have learned and what we do have for now. Um, and I think she does a great job of pushing people too. Okay. I definitely agree with Jamie as far as the Stern Center goes. I think that's important. Yeah. Yep, the Stern Center usually gets really good results. Um, yeah. Owen raised his hand and I think he'll probably, um, we'll have time for his comments before we transition to our 6 p.m. meeting. Um, I'm just, posting that Google Meet in our comments thread um, so that I won't distract anybody from what Owen has to share. I just would share that this summer we had um, some of our English language arts teachers created a, um, a model to write, to create a, um, a paragraph writing exercise where students in the middle school will learn how to write a very uh, powerful paragraph and keep adding to that and that it'll be universal in our middle school. So it'll be, teachers will be using it all throughout the curriculum in all areas, including art, math, wherever it is that the writing standard will be the same. And they also vetted that with all those other 3000 middle school educators and those folks at UVM, those experts, and we're rolling that out this year. I would also echo Andrew's piece about Mindy Beth Mindy Beth is not only a reading specialist, she's also a secondary social studies teacher. So she really understands the entire, the entire um, span of, of learning. The end. What do you, what do you do in the high school? What do we do for reading? Yeah, I asked Reed what, what, uh, what the reading experience is in the high school. So we, uh, uh, we have one special ed case manager for 27 kids on IEPs. She is Wilson reading certified, but because she spends so much of her time doing cases, she has very little time to get out of the paperwork and all the meetings that she has to do. But oh, we just hired a second special. We just hired a second one who's not certified as a special educator yet and has no experience. So I, I think we're going to be slowing down in special education over the next couple months in order to speed up in the future. Uh, we're also down to one paraeducator for special education. We've had the position posted for three or four months and had had zero applicants. Uh, so we, we, we had a very qualified math para last year, and now you know, we're, we're shorthanded and can't provide services that are written into IEPs. Uh, that's the extent of our reading teaching. Uh, we do have a high school English teacher who teaches a literacy lab. So for ninth graders who are struggling readers or writers, they have a small uh, kind of off schedule, off requirement course that they take 
where they can get help. Uh, but I'm not aware that my English teachers have any reading, any special reading training that they can provide for students. Do you have a resource room for all students? No, we do not. I mean, one of the things I think we'll look to do as we as we move forward is I think it's really important that we have our teachers uh, trained up at interventions all the way through 12. Um, and LOI goes all the way up now. And so one of the things Reed and I've started talking about as we build our MTSS is how do we have courses of study that have proficiencies tied in so students don't feel like they're just going to this extra thing that yes, you're working on gap filling, but yes, you're also working on proficiency toward graduation. Um, and LLI, can you just, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, level who... the intervention. It's essentially what it is, yeah. so folks know, when you talk about small group reading, it is a, an approach to having a really strong literacy group. Mm -hmm. For a small group, the text is at your level. There's written components to it so that you write about the text. Um, and it's a pretty sequential approach to teaching and reading. I find that it worked well for comprehension and it can strengthen fluency. Um, but when we think about the younger levels, at times students really just still struggle with basic phonics and how to decode words. And that's where I think we need to make sure we have something more than just level literacy intervention. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think we should transition into our next meeting. I'm going to leave this window open and simply mute my mic and my camera so that we keep the comments um, going. So I'll see you all in our next screen. Okay, bye. Gotta go to this one first. All right, thank you all. Was there more to discuss in our literacy discussion? Um, or are we moving forward in our agenda um, to our final agenda item, which is our 2021-2022 budget goals? Well, let's talk about that. The budget goals, yeah. OK. Um, so, Jamie, I know that you have thoughts on this in terms of the budget really being a policy statement from the board. Um, Can so, you I'd like to out for a second, Lisa. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, I'm. I feel like he should really lead this discussion. Is where I was going with that. Um. We did have a little bit of discussion at the finance committee about this, and um, you know, he was kind of looking for a direction on where the board wanted the budget to go, like what we want to, like what we want to have happen with, you know, tax. Stuff. Um, I kind of feel like it's going to be impossible to really know, given the state of the Ed Fund and you know, just the state of everything, like what. Like we have no idea what's going to happen with the state yield, so it's hard to know what we need to do with our budget in order to kind of do taxes and stuff. You know, the approach this year is going to be to do the zero level budgeting where we start from zero, add things in as, you know, the, that's what the administration is going to do. So they come to us with what they think is necessary and then we can go from there. So I think that that's a better approach than us trying to come up with some like we want it to go up or down when we really don't have any way of knowing right now how that's gonna translate to tax rate. So that's what I'm... I agree with Andrew. Um, Andrew was just sharing that he felt it would be difficult to, as a board, say we want the budget to go up or down because we just don't know the state of affairs with the yield and with the ed fund. But that starting at ground zero and working our way up in the budget will help them understand what we need. I think it would you guys be tell us where I'm, you think we should be, and then we'll we'll go from there. Anyway. I'm looking for if the board has any like 
priorities, right? Like we'd like you to prioritize math intervention because we don't have math intervention right now as a targeted intervention and support. It would just be good to hear some things that you'd like us potentially to focus on. We want you to focus on you know, creating capstone projects and doing more personalized learning. I think that this is your policy document and that will help inform what we want to prioritize and how we're going to trade things as we move forward. I mean, I'm all about you, you trade things to increase offerings in other places. So it would be, I'm looking for in this discussion just to hear you guys talk about some priorities for the budget. Some overarching goals. Yeah, um, I feel like if you feel like we're at a place where um, math intervention needs to be focused on, that's really important. We've been really focused on literacy and hoping that improving literacy would improve math, just because um, math is more text heavy than I think a lot of people give it credit for. Um, in my mind, having capstone projects, beginning to roll those up um, through our younger grades, um, not necessarily starting with 12th grade, but, but getting our students in the practice of um, working on projects that are meaningful to them and then being able to share about those projects and um, document that in writing is really important. Uh, I'm just throwing my own thoughts out there, um, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the board. Um, I also feel like um, having students have access to um, a lot of different pathways, which I know that they do, um, but to the degree possible, um, starting more of that um, earlier. And I also don't want to go back in terms of outdoor education. I think that's something that's so important and valued by our community um, that I, it's a lot, I think, that we're expecting. But at the same time, I don't want our outdoor focus to suddenly be detracted from as we shift to other priorities. Um, I would second that. Um, the other one that I would say would be, um... You know, I would say something similar about music, where that's always been a strength of some of our other schools and that's important to the community. And so I know we are not filling the music position currently, but I think long term, we should be looking to make sure that we have a very strong music program. Um, as far as the math intervention goes, like I'm going to let the um, professionals tell me what sort of things we need to be doing for you know, best results for our students. Um, the one other thing I would mention would be, um, we were kind of talking before COVID and all this about trying to set up um, like a full, full day preschool with kind of aftercare options where we would charge tuition or not tuition, but you know, like kind of have daycare option so that it would be a full business day offering for families in order to try and get our preschool enrollments up and you know hopefully that sort of thing would pay for itself by increased enrollment and then right. um, whatever tuitions we were able to charge. So I would like to be able to continue looking to build something like that um, and that would be in the budget that we'd be building. And I know that that's not really possible with the current you know COVID stuff but long term I think we should still be thinking about it. I'd like to hear from all the, I'd like to hear from each individual principal about what they think um, we should be looking at as we build this budget. And I think. Um, I agree with you, Bob. I'm wondering if we can hear from the remaining three board members and then we'll check in with all the administrators that just like to hear from everybody who's on this call um, and then we can discuss what's well, out there. Would, yeah, well, that would be my suggestion when we're building the budget to listen to each principal about their goals, what they'd like to do with the school and what 
you know, what their interests are or what they're interested in building. That would be um, something that I would like to see as you build, as we build the budget. So, thank you. I would. I like the. I mean, I agree with the uh, math and the capstone projects, uh, the outdoor education. It's what I've heard so far, I'm I'm definitely in, on board with. I would also. Um, to build on the outdoor education, I really think we need to do more ag in the classroom and the school. I'd love to see the school more involved with growing food for the school and turning those into teaching moments. So I'd love to see that expand. Yeah, thank you. Chris? Yeah, I think uh, for me, in terms of the budget, uh, the budget process, I think, you know, the idea of starting with, you know, sort of zero based budgeting uh, would be good and building the budget from there. And, and, you know, and with that, having the discussion about, uh, you know, you know, we know, we know what salary is going to go to, we know what, you know, what a lot of the different identified spending is going to go to, but again, yeah, what, what goals of the school, you know, when we look at the controllable budget in terms of things that, that we have control over, what are we putting the money towards and why and, and, and being able to, you know, for us turn around and present that to the community as well. I think sometimes, you know, with everything that's going on, the budget process sometimes, you know, gets, you know, we, we get up against the wall and, and we can't give as much thought uh, to it as we would like to all the time in terms of of you know we have our eye on that in number but sometimes we lose the 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 whys uh while we're going through it you know why are we you know what are the purposes that this budget's going to serve and we try to flesh that out for the you know the community but you know i think if we can talk about that more and focus on that at the beginning that'll help us out too and then yeah in terms of other things i think you know what the the administrators and teachers, you know, express or their areas of concern and need and where they need support, you know, so if it is math intervention, uh, you know, that's one from the community, we have heard things about, you know, people's need for, um, for daycare. And, and, you know, and I think, you know, we've seen the model be successful uh, in our neighboring town of Sharon. And I think that's something that we were hoping to try to replicate. Uh, so, you know, who knows what the, you know, what the numbers and, and people and population is going to look like post COVID, depending on, you know, how things go and how long it drags on and stuff. But, uh, but I think that is one of the more, you know, immediate goals that we had for, for, you know, the new things. So. Thank you. Um, would any of the administrators like to jump in and share your perspective on what our, what our, um, focus should be for the budget as we rebuild it. Not overspending. Well, right, but but focus on our kids, that piece. Yeah. I think um, we, we haven't planned to do this. Um, this is sort of putting us on the spot a little, so we're not coordinated, which is one thing making me a little uncomfortable. And we haven't talked to our boss about this at all either. I can. Oh, and I, you are such a good man. Well, I think, I think it is a little yes. bit of a setup, and I want to be careful. Yeah, no. So what I would say to the board is, is our plan is to roll out our priorities to you month by month, okay. right? And we're going to tell you a narrative and the why, and what we need in student support in October, and then we're going to do universal instruction in November. Yeah, what I was looking at is I wanted to get a few one up from the board so that we can take that into account when we're meeting and discussing. And the budgeting process is going to be such that these three are going to be in a room with Tara, myself, Don McMahon, and Mary Ellen next Wednesday for three hours to work on student support. Um, and so it will be a very collaborative process. Um, and so what I was looking to do is get a sense from the board about some priorities you had because we could use that um, when we were going into that budget process um, to provide a budget to you that also hit your priorities. 
as well as you know the idea of the you know the three overarching goals of MTSS personalized learning and increase interdependence and more community connection. Lisa? Yes. Um, my, my, thing, my intent is not to have administrators say right now what their goals are because they need to think about that. Um, yeah. But during the budget process, we need to hear from, we need to hear from the principals in their buildings and maybe that's after they have the conversation with Jamie, but uh, about what we need to make, that what they would like to see in the budget um, during next year. So it's not that like I want to know right now. I, I, I'd like, during the process, the budget process, I'd like to hear what the individual principals um, are, are supporting in their, in their schools or would like to support in their schools. I appreciate that, and I think um, I also appreciate Owen pushing back to to give more time to that conversation. Right. I think yeah. it's important that that the administrators work with their teachers and work with Jamie, um, and that that we come up with something cohesive that um, represents our values, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I appreciate that we were asked as a board. Um, and I think that also the the metrics metrics for success that we worked on also um, represent those values. I think a lot of the things um, that we care about are represented in that document. So I appreciate that. Um, maybe since the, if we're kind of trying to use this um, this retreat as kind of an annual look at what our priorities do want our priorities. Why don't we try and both come prepared next year's retreat with kind of the overall priorities. Um, so we can like not not on a like this is what we need in the budget, but just so that you guys could talk about it with us at the time. Does that I make like, sense? Yeah. I like the idea of presenting um, sort of an overview of data um, to think about how our money has been spent um, and then creating the outlook for where our needs may be um, looking forward at, at an, but building the budget for the upcoming year. So I think that could be really powerful. Other thoughts? No, that makes a ton of sense. Okay. Do you feel like you have what you were looking for from us to move forward with this? Yeah, I think I think we got to start. I mean, it sounds like I mean what I'm hearing, and I I'm going to try to paraphrase, and you guys can correct us. Is I'm hearing that you want to increase personalized learning through things like capstone projects. You want to make certain that experiential learning and outdoor education continues to be a priority. You want to ensure that. The uh, performing arts is strong. You want to make look at us uh, having a robust pre-K offering and after-school program that looks similar to Sharon. And um, you know, I threw out the mask. I don't know if that influenced you. I just I I want us to continue. I heard in the past you want to continue the momentum in literacy, but I also think. We also do have to look at mathematics, and my concern is is really automaticity of facts and students having strong number sense um, and place value. I think when you have those core concepts down through the primary grades, you can do a lot as you move up through. And if you don't have those foundational skills strong in mathematics, it's a long haul. And so I just I'm very concerned right now. That was more of an SU statement. We don't have any type of math intervention across the supervisory union, um, and that's a concern for me. It's very limited anyways. And mm -hmm. I'd like us to build up a student support system that if a student needs intervention, they can get it. Yeah, I agree with that, um, that it would be great to have that. I do want to make sure, though, that if it's an SU-wide program, um, that it 
that the primary um, cost and drivers aren't necessarily White River Union District or Unified yeah, District. No, and I'm, I'm not talking about the SU wide program even, you know. Okay. I'm thinking that we have an SU wide approach to mathematics instruction and how we go about it and the tools we use could differ. Um, um, I'm guessing the title funds could likely be used for this. Yes. It's, it's part of what I was discussing at the SU level when we did some restructuring is that I, part of that restructuring was to leverage our title funds back into the schools more and not have our title funds sit as much at the SU level. So our title funds right now are funding several positions at the supervisory union office and I'd like to leverage and push those back out into the buildings as much as possible. Um, so we've kind of talked about overall educational goals. Um, it seems like the other piece that we should probably figure out is what the plan is for the, are we going to go to the voters for a three, to try and spread it out over three years? Are we going to try and get rid of it this year? Like what, what's our law? Andrew, I will have further legal opinion on Monday. I got an email from some of the attorneys today that I've been working with that they're researching some additional statute and options to make sure we have a clear understanding of the regulations around what we're trying to do. So I will have some more information on those off, on those options for you at our next meeting, just to give you a heads up. Is it something that we can discuss now, or should do yeah, we? Yeah, I think it's fine to discuss it. Okay. Um, I mean, I think my opinion would be that we should go to voters and try and get a three-year note to spread it out over three years, and probably be around two or three cents a year added to the tax rate a year for the next three years, and then. The nice thing about that is that once that's done, we can have that kind of cushion built into the budget for building up reserve funds like that. Once that came in. I think that's an excellent idea, Andrew. I agree totally. I, I agree as well. If we're able to do that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think it is important, Andrew, when we go to the community, we talk about the changes we've made to ensure we don't get in this place again. But I also think your idea of that if we're able to do, set this money aside for the next three years and how crucial it is for us to start to have reserve accounts. And one of the things I'd be interested in hearing from you guys is whether or not you want to try to, I know it's a tough year to do this, but at least start putting a little bit away so that you get the, our communities um, kind of in a sense of this is important, we're planning ahead and it's just a part of how we do business in RUD. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about that too. Yeah, I think I, I like the idea and concept, but I think we'd need to see what all this turns into tax rate wise. Yeah. You know, if, if, you know, it's really hard to say right now, you know, I think if, if it's possible, we should definitely do it. If we already have a four cent tax hike or who knows what, you know, that, Probably not. Yeah, um, one other thing that I've been thinking about as part of the budget discussion, and I think I probably should have thought about it back in our metrics, metrics for success discussion, is um, I know we've made a lot of shifts in what was formerly the um, restorative classroom. And I love that we aren't calling it that anymore. I always struggled with that name. Um, but anyway, I am wondering how we're going to measure the success of that program, um, both from an efficiency standpoint, but more importantly, in my mind, from a, um, returning students to um, our core academics standpoint. I do think that's important, but I think that's probably an SU discussion, right? Well, it is an SU discussion, and it's also a um, RUD discussion, because we house the programs at this particular point in time. Um, and we also have had, at times, the highest percentage of students in those programs. Um, 
And I want those kids to be able to go to our middle school and go to our high school. Um, so I, I, I think it fits in both places. Um, but given the struggle we had just to get people to help us pay for the reno renovation by percentage of students there, this was before Jamie's time, but literally um, our said, you know, their percentage of the renovation was $7,000. And if they sent the students that we were educating to alternative programs, it would have cost them $150,000. And we had lengthy discussion at the full board meeting about um, how they could defend those $7,000 to their taxpayers. Um, and so I guess I just feel like We've had to fight to be reimbursed at times for portions that made total sense by percentage to have reimbursed. Um, so I guess I feel greater ownership over it than maybe I have a right to. Um, but from the standpoint of doing what's right for students, I think we need to find some way to measure that program. Yeah, I would agree fully. I mean, that's something that is gonna come up at the full SU board when we talk about the, that budget. Um, and it's going to come up in student support budgets because you guys are going to see your percentage and kind of breakout of special ed um, it, at each district level because I think it's important that you guys still see that even though it's an SU expense. So we are going to break it out and then we'll pull it back in the overall SU budget proposal. But something that I've talked to you, uh, your principals about and Don um, and the SU principals in general is whether or not it's the best approach to have an RC classroom or an alternative uh, placement for students in grades K through two. And one of the things we're talking about is maybe taking some of those resources and leverage them more up to the high school to increase different pathway offerings and programmings there that right now we don't have for our students who are struggling um, in the more traditional factory model. And the good news is the space is already there. And so that's important. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, when I go to the full SU board about this, I'm gonna, you know, we'll have the numbers to talk to them about how many students right now we currently have in out of district placements, not just at Rudd, but across the entire SU, that we could be taking care of their needs here um, through Rudd and through the WRBSU programming. And so, the other thing is too, the research really shows that most students that drop out of high school make that decision by fourth grade. More and more, that's what the research is speaking to. And I'm very concerned about taking students out of their home schools and placing them in a different setting and what that communicates as a five or a six year old. So we're talking about maybe going with a team approach of experts that really strong uh, social emotional interventionists that we build up like our own BIs that work under the umbrella of that program, but we push those out into the schools and they would support the school team with executing a behavior plan there instead of actually taking the student out. And so that's gonna be part of the proposal we run by uh, the full board, but you also hear about that in your local board meetings in October. Um, you know, one of the things that I am concerned about is the right now the cost per pupil um, in those programs. It, it was in Don's uh, report in July. Right now, we're spending about thirty-seven and change per student, um, and so there's not really any difference between that and sending a student to EBA. Um, and so that's a uh, well, EBA you get reimbursed. EBA's tuition just went up 50 grand. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it went up by 50 grand or went up? It went up 50 grand today. Right, and if the student's not on the IEP. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. And if the student's not on an IEP, then you don't get reimbursed, correct? Yeah, no. If we are sending students out of district placements that are not service via IEP, you're, you're covering that entire cost. And, you right. know, thing that I say to folks all the time is, you know, we say, you know, I've heard folks say before when I did, used to do a lot of um, consulting work, well, that's special ed, we can't ever think about the budget. That's so not true. We need to look at how are we building program to meet students' needs 
And um, there's not this endless pot of money. And the other thing the board has to think about is the ed funding could change soon. Um, it's going to at some point, the block grant's gonna come in and the SU will get a lump sum of money to support students and that funding won't be tied to IEPs. Right. So there is more, there is more leeway there about how we support our students. Um, and there's more flexibility. I think that's important. Yeah, I think um, when we first started the restorative classroom, the, we were sending quite a few students who were not on IEPs to Raven, to Choice, to the new school, to um, EVA. So um, I think that this that program allowed us um, to save a lot of money in those ways. But yeah, so $30,000 as compared to some of those um, is pocket change. And also, if you're able to return them to the classroom, like that was the initial goal, if you yeah, were able yeah. to do that, then you save a lot in the lifetime of the student compared to sending something. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very in support of this. I'm just saying that you're spending a lot. Right now, the percentage of the number of students you have in K2 is very small, and you have a full-fledged staff. I think if you use those resources at the high school, you could pull back a lot more students. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Yeah, but um, you know, like if you are spending, let's say we spent more per student than we would sending out, but we're actually able to return them to the school, we'd still spend less. In the school. So, you know, I wouldn't want to decrease funding for K to two, but then those kids aren't getting the service that they need to kind of get back mainstream. No, no, no. I'm saying we're not even going to take them out of their school, Andrew. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah, and this is a philosophical thing. I just, as your superintendent, I have a really hard time taking a six-year-old out of his school. Yeah. Yeah. Or her school. I think there's a case once in a while you have to do it. I think there's a way we could be strategic about it. I just think right now we, I think there's been times we've seen we've had students in that program that I think we didn't exhaust all the interventions and supports we could have prior to removing them from their home school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts on um, budget priorities from the board so that we can give the administrators as much um, to think about or as much of a read on our thoughts as possible? Okay. Any other? Um, because it feels like we've cruised through our agenda for this evening. So is there anything else that's on people's minds? Lisa, I, I have something I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, because of the work that the that the Tara and the business office have done and the work that the principals have done to control the budget. I'd like to, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the superintendent to spend money as long as he stays within the budget um, and the budget lines, whatever they may be. Um, therefore, that would, if that's the motion, okay? And, I, and I'd like to say that makes it easier on Rodney because the central office is making sure that we're not overspending the budget. When Rodney signs those warrants, uh, mm -hmm. he, can, he can feel confident that everything's okay. All right? Uh, <clears throat> is there any second for this? Um, and then we'll have discussion. Um, can I just get some clarification on the, the wording of the motion? Because that was a long sentence. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, I make a motion that the superintendent uh, would authorize the superintendent to spend money and stay within the budget as long as or the budget lines. Let's do that again. Super, 
I would make a motion to authorize the superintendent to spend money as long as he stays within the budget and budget lines change, but he knows what I'm talking about. So. So when Rodney signs the warrants, he doesn't have to worry that we're overspending. Um, do we have a second for that? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Um, I feel like this is pretty consistent with the practice um, that we've outlined as an expectation since Jamie's been with us. Um, so I'd be curious to hear their thoughts. Um, if this, if this seems consistent with what we, the direction we've been moving. Whose thoughts are you looking for? Mine and Tara? Mm -hmm. I think this makes a great deal of sense. I think you have it. Then it's been moved. It's on the record. And I would say that there's some accountability to that, which I appreciate. And it certainly aligns with your guys' uh, job description and the ad you put out when you hired me. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor of Bob's. All right. I guess I just don't understand what the difference is between what we're doing now. Because, like, basically, you know, the superintendent approves spending. It goes to a warrant. Rodney signs it. We spend the money. I think after this, the superintendent will approve spending. Rodney will sign it. The money gets spent. So I'm okay doing it. I just don't know what the practical, like, it kind of sets the message, but I don't know. Well, Andrew, have you looked at the warrant? I mean, yeah, you, I, I know what you said at the beginning where like he's signing that it's within the budget and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, right. I mean, would you be, would you want to make a motion to change the wording on that? No, I just want to give the superintendent the authority to make sure it doesn't happen. You know, no overspending happens. Or else he has to come to the board if he's going to overspend the budget. Okay. Basically, right now, he has a freedom... Well, I say he, he his office has the freedom uh, to make up a warrant and give it to us for our signature. Rodney is one person on the board, and you know if a line's overdrawn, he has no idea. So all I'm saying now is that he has to stay within the budget, and he can't overspend any lines. He'll have to come to the board for approval. Other than that. He can they can produce the warrant and run and Rodney can sign it feeling confident that it is what it, that it is well, the deal. You know? Okay. I think if that's the goal, then we probably should state that something like you know, yeah, I didn't yeah. gather an emotion of the overspending out expenditure of lines and I will tell you there's gonna be lines that will be overspent and then we'll reconcile the balance the lines. Right. So the the ocean as I understand it and as I I believe it was recorded, is that the budget would not be overspent right. because we understand that the lines may need to be shifted. Right. Um, right. Particularly right. Wow. with the, the budgeting know. that we've been through previously, where certain lines haven't been budgeted at all, um, but we actually need to spend money in those areas. So as we go through a process of correctly coding things and getting our books back in order, I would personally feel uncomfortable if we said that lines couldn't be shifted. However, I'm fully in support of the budget not being overspent. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not referring to the lines because he has the ability to change those, you know, to change money on lines, but he's got to stay within the budget. That's all I'm saying. Right. So, but the, the way that it's worded is that you authorize and spend money and as long as it's within the budget, I wonder if it'd be better to word it something like, if, uh, like the superintendent must come to the board if there's any spending, anticipated spending that will um, go up, cause the budget to be over, something like that. So would rather than saying, budget. what? Would exceed the approved budget. Right. And I think you need to have wording in there so that it's like, 
when you are doing some spending that you know will cause the budget to be overspent because it's not like you know when you have your encumbered money and stuff it's not until you actually get to the point spent some of this other money that you actually exceed the budget but it's some decision back you know in october that was when you knew you were spending over in some category and not able to make it up somewhere else you know what i mean so i i just don't know that the the I think maybe we can reword it so that it's saying that if he knows he's going to overspend the budget, he comes to the board for approval. Does that make sense? I think, yeah, I think it says the same thing that I want to say. So it sounds like it's an extra line would be added then. So to authorize a superintendent to spend money as long as he stays within the approved budget. However, if, and what did you say, Andrew? If, well, I would I would replace instead of having authorizing the spending up until the budget. I mm -hmm. think the focus would be on like I make a motion that the superintendent require or requiring the superintendent to get board approval for any spending that would be over the over the approved budget. Something like that. I'll withdraw my motion. You know, if, uh, I think. Andrew's saying the same thing. I am in a different way, but I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. Does I'm sorry. I don't have my book of Robert Robert's rules of order. I don't know if we need a second to withdraw a motion because somebody seconded. Oh, Chris just has to withdraw his withdraw his second. Okay. All right. So <laughs> Andrew, are you making a motion? Um. Sure. To replace the withdrawn one. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. So the motion is the superintendent will come before the board to authorize any spending that will be in excess of the budget, approved budget, I guess. Do we have a second for that I'll motion? Second. I'll second that. Perfect. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of um, Andrew's motion that indicates that the superintendent um, will come before the board if he is overspending the budget, the annual budget. Um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, Lisa, I'm wondering how you voted. You can put it in the chat. Or I, I, said, I said aye. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and the motion carries. But, yeah, I guess maybe it's a little after the fact now that we've carried the motion. But let's say we get into a situation where the superintendent, like we're already over the budget and the superintendent, like do we expect the superintendent to come back with every single expenditure that happens after that? Or, I mean, I guess it would just be the the one expenditure that he knows is going to exceed the... Uh, well, I think at that point in time, we're in trouble. So. Right, I think yeah. the hope is that we don't have to have that conversation, but if we do, uh, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty hopeful. As an accountability piece, I do think um, <laughs> that we... That. What's that? that? We better stop that. <laughs> right. I think as an accountability piece, the board does need to have a discussion of how it happened. Um, I, I appreciate that we've been doing um, since since Jamie took took the, you know, took things over. So thank you. So I guess the other part of that would be you know, when there's, when it's the SU budget, you know, I guess we just need to be notified that the SU budget yeah, is it, overspent it, it, and uh, we're going we're, to- We're going to be keeping close dibs on both all year. I'm going to have monthly reports. So if we're projecting that the SU budget is going to run over and affect your budget, you will know as soon as we we know that. Yeah. But I we're, just... The motion just said that we have to authorize that. Like, I don't know that there's, we really have discretion not to authorize that, but mm -hmm. 
I guess if you come and tell us, that's good. <laughs> well, I think it would, if the SU budget is running your budget over, right, which it has the last two years, then I would not be spending your local money unless you authorize me to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think, you know, the idea would be that you guys control that local budget. And so if the SU is what's running over, you need to know that you're projecting that you're going in the red and then make some decisions based off of that. But, you know, the hope is, is that we've got things in order so that we're not running over in the SU and causing you guys trouble. Okay. Um, so what are the what are the pieces that we can put in place um, as a full board? I feel like, I mean, I wasn't at the full board meeting, so maybe this is a discussion that's already begun. But I feel like um, putting measures in place at that level is also really important. Well, Lisa, I mean, I brought it up. I mean, I'm a Harold's going to have an article next week that talks about special ed has run over about 250,000 a year. The biggest thing we have to do is monitor how we're supporting students and ensure that we have tight reins on the special ed budget. Now, Tara did a great job of using the service plan last fall to build the special ed budget. So I feel confident that, that special ed budget's real and that we're not gonna have that type of run over this year. And I know Don is monitoring it very closely. And we've made some decisions at management not to replace some personnel to ensure that we don't overrun it. All good news. I mean, we've also frozen central the SU spending. I mean, coming out of this office significantly. And we did, we did a lot of changes with our grants to ensure that both Tara and I are both monitoring those in conjunction with Cynthia and even Mary Allen um, to make certain that nothing's being spent out of the federal grants that don't tie back. Um, and, you know, to ensure that we're not incurring any unanticipated costs there because we didn't actually get the money that was spent. Right. Our, in full disclosure, our only scenario right now where that is happening is in our CRF and our ESSER funds COVID. for COVID related expenditures. So we are banking that we are going to get money, but we may not get as much money as we've had to spend in order to accommodate the rules and regulations for COVID-19. So I just, I don't yeah, want that to be point. forgotten. Yeah, that's a good point. And I will say the yeah. good news there on a financial update is, I don't know if they changed it with your group, but the superintendent's organization was notified yesterday that it does look like they're going to contribute another $88 million toward CARES money, which should be helpful. Great. Right. Yep. <clears throat> and it doesn't right. look like we're going to be penalized for our ADM drops for students that chose homeschooling this year. They're gonna hold us harmless. Your ADM won't be able to go lower than the 1920 school year. All this, so I do worry about that, you know, Montpelier is gonna have uh, some work to do because I do worry about the Ed Fund and what that could do to taxes in the spring. Yep. That's great. For, for now, that's great. Well, for now, <laughs> I just, I think this money is going to come from somewhere at some point, and I just, it just makes me nervous. That's all. Yep, I agree. Um, do we need to authorize, Lisa, do we need to authorize you to be able to sign the note for the loan or line of credit, whatever, for the board? Yeah, I feel like that happens when we reorganize that I automatically get that honor, which it makes my stomach hurt every time I have to do it. Right. Um, but um, as long as as long as the board has voted to give you that right, and then it's OK. But so Tara, do you need any additional authorization from your perspective? 
for me to do that. The bank did not tell me I needed anything additional, so I will have to get back to you on that. I don't want to misspeak. All right. Do we get it now? Because Why don't we just do it? Because we right. don't need that cash, and I don't want to do an emergency meeting. Yeah, so. Good catch, Bob. To authorize Lisa Floyd to sign on the board's behalf for any loan procured for the district. Or line of credit. Or a line of credit. From the Community National Bank. From the Community National Bank. Thank you. Not to exceed $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting punchy. All right, would anybody second that motion? I'll second it. Okay. So um, all in favor of approving, giving Lisa Floyd, our board chair, the opportunity to sign um, or the, the right to sign the... Um, now I can't remember it. Community National Bank line of credit not to exceed six hundred thousand dollars. Please say aye. 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 <laughs> All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll do that. Um, should I need to? Thank you. I do uh, need you to sign, Lisa, the subgrant agreement between the SU and RUD. So at some point when you are available, you could come visit me or I can email it to you if you prefer to sign electronically. Yes. Um, email might be easier because I just find I'm at work late a lot of days. Um, I will scan them and get them emailed to you. Perfect. It's the standard subgrant agreement that we do every year. Yep. I remember those. All right. Any other that we should talk about or anything that we want to add to our October board meeting? I would like to uh, bring up, I have now been approached by two other solar companies who would like to provide presentations to the boards. I don't we haven't really had a chance to debrief after Encore made their presentation to you all to know, to, to get your pulse as to if you're interested or not. And then these two other companies that have now come to the surface and wanting to present. So I just need some guidance or feedback on where you're all at and what you would like me to do with some direction as far as that's concerned. So is that for the October meeting or do uh, you I'm just going to let you know in October you have all your star 360 data to review okay. for reading and math and you're going to get your student support budget. Okay. So I, I, if you're going to those presentations tend to last at least I mean 15 minutes to a half an hour. So you know just take that time into account. If that's the case then I would say that's all you have on your budget is those are those items because okay. And you just get whatever details they have to send and email them to us. And then, like, I don't know that we need to have another presentation. Please, no. yeah, I don't think so. I, I would I would ask the superintendent to review everything and make a recommendation, and we could go from there. Yeah, and then our, I think just for... So I think what this presentation was, I mean, this was before Jamie was on board, but I think with Encore, and I think it would be our concern with any other one too, is depending on how it's set up is, you know, is it flexible or not? I mean, I think the thing with Encore was, you know, we could save money based on our current electrical consumption, but, you know, if our consumption goes down, say we do any energy efficiency pro uh, projects like replace lighting, replace HVAC equipment, and now we're more energy efficient, we were still going to be on the hook for what we committed to that was based on what our current consumption at the time was for the next, what was it, 20 years or something like that. Yeah, Chris, I had the same worries when I reviewed it. Yeah. So and I didn't get a lot of great answers when I talked to them, had Tara push, I think it was them, pushed on them a little more about true savings. So. Yeah. So I think if it's a plan that can be flexible with us as we hopefully shrink any electrical consumption that we have, because, uh, uh -huh. you know, I think, you know, we're not, we're not going to add, you know, we don't have any plans to add on to our buildings or do anything like that. So if anything happens to our electrical uses, it should be 
that we're doing improvements to our building where our usage goes down and we need something that's going to be flexible with us and not pigeonhole us into a certain profile. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could, previous to that meeting, um, get that data so that I just feel like if I can review the data before I come to the meeting, then I can ask better questions. I'll be in your principal's report. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other other? No? Okay. We are about 52 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, so if that's not problematic for anyone, I would entertain a motion to adjourn early. I move to adjourn. Okay. Second. I, I, I planned my whole evening around this. <laughs> I mean, I can hang out in the grid with you, Owen. I'll go make another cup of coffee. Be right back. Oh, that's one of your love signs in the back. Yeah. I'm still waiting on them. There's a whole bunch of them. And let me just say, the board members haven't gotten them either. Okay, well, they'll be for sale starting tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And we have t-shirts we have t -shirts and masks. Nice. And onesies. Jamie, I have an email I want to run by you. Can I send it to you and you give me feedback? Yeah. I want, to send it, I want to send it out tonight. Yeah, I'll have it right now. I'll send it to you right now. Okay. I have a Can second. What's that? Good night. Thank you all so much. Hello.